report directly to the Blue Cross when patients arrive. Bill Blue Cross directed. Since my inauguration on January the 19th, I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you this evening about the right-to-work law and placing the right-to-work law in our state constitution. The legislature of the state of Mississippi in April this year voted overwhelmingly in favor of making the right-to-work law a part of our state constitution. In fact, the House of Representatives voted 109 to 16, and the Senate voted 33 to 6 in favor of making the right-to-work law a part of our state constitution. The first sentence in the resolution adopted by the overwhelming vote of the legislature is in language which I am going to hold up before you, which says this, it is hereby declared to be the public policy of Mississippi that the right of a person or persons to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of membership or non-membership in any labor union or labor organization. The right to work law, which I am strongly recommending as an amendment to the state constitution, does for the Mississippi worker what it says in the first sentence of the resolution, and that is it reserves the right of every worker to join a union if such person so desires to become a member of the union. It also provides that no one can be forced to join a union if such person does not care to become a member of the union. Friends, I've always had a high regard for unions. They've contributed much to the economic development, the culture and social life of our great state. What could be a fairer proposition than that? If he wants to join, he may join, but if he doesn't want to join, he doesn't have to join. If he wants to join a union, he may do so of his own volition. If he does not want to join a union, then under this resolution, under the right to work law, no one can force him to join. It means he cannot be precluded from getting a job if he does not belong to a union, and he cannot be discharged from a job because he chooses to join a union. In other words, it gives the individual worker the right to choose whether or not he wants to join a union or a labor organization. There are some people in Detroit, Michigan, New York, Washington, and other large cities who don't like this law at all. Jimmy Hoffer is one of them. Walter Ruther is another. And there are other selfish, greedy, and ruthless labor bosses who do not approve of this law. Most of them, though, ladies and gentlemen, have selfish motives in that they want the power and the authority to control so they can force people to join a union and force them to pay dues by intimidation and coercion. Liberty-loving Mississippians are not in favor of being intimidated or coerced into becoming a member of a union or a member of any other organization. I believe such person should be entitled to work in order that he may make a living for himself and his family, whether he belongs to a union or not. Being coerced by some greedy, selfish labor bosses to join a union before he can obtain a job, friend is contrary to our way of life. Freedom-loving people of Mississippi believe in the freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is a great fundamental principle in our form of government, which is the greatest form of government that has ever been promulgated for man's benefit. We have been blessed here in Mississippi with the right to work law for nearly seven years. 19 states have the right to work law. What does it mean to the people of Mississippi? Statistics show 
that the percentage of gains in earnings in Mississippi during the time since the enactment of our right to work law amounts to more than the average in the states where they do not have the right to work law. Give us some figures, bastard. For instance, ladies and gentlemen, may I call your attention to the increase. Increase in wages of workers in manufacturing during right to work years in Mississippi and in the United States. In the United States, the average increase has been 17%. But the increase in Mississippi since the right to work law has been enforced is 28%. 11% higher than the average increase in the nation. That clearly convinces me that the right to work law is very beneficial to all people and particular to the working people. If our right to work law is made a part of our Constitution, it will contribute much in the years that lie ahead toward bringing much business and more industries to Mississippi. It'll contribute much for creating more jobs. It'll contribute much for increasing our income per person. It'll contribute much to a higher standard of living throughout the entire state. It'll mean industrial freedom for all of our people. It'll contribute much to creating a better industrial climate for all of the people of our state. Mississippi and all other American states that have a right to work law have prospered materially since the enactment of the right to work law. The 19 states that have the right to work law show an average increase in their economies of more than 24%. Now here's a little plaque showing the increase, the number of industrial jobs during the right to work years. Average 4.4 for the United States. In Mississippi, the average is 8.5. 29,000 new jobs created in Mississippi during the right to work years. The economics in the states that do not have the right to work law have increased only 21%. Therefore, there is a difference in the earnings, friends, of the states that have the right to work law and the states that do not have the right to work law. For instance, I want to call your attention to the economic conditions in the state of Indiana, a great industrial state. According to a magazine which was issued in February 1960, the state of Indiana, it is claimed, and I have no doubt about it, has increased more rapidly in industrial growth, in new construction of industries than any other state in the whole American Union. There are five reasons listed in the February issue of the magazine, and the first one that is listed is the right to work law. Friends, that's something that no one can deny. Here is the article that I have in mind. Indiana leads the nation in new plant construction for capital for the sixth straight year. And they list here five reasons. One, two, three, four, five. The right to work law. The first such law enacted and kept by a major industrial state. Ladies and gentlemen, that's conclusive to my humble way of thinking that the right to work law is sound in every way. It has contributed much to the development 
of the 19 states that have the right to work law. On the front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal today, we find these words, headlines, strike, menaces, missile bases in California, San Diego, California. Friends, they don't have a right to work law in California. Labor unions are controlled by bosses. And through the big labor bosses in California, they tie up labor in defense installations and materially affect our national security. We need larger metropolitan centers in Mississippi. One reason our income is so low in Mississippi is because we don't have large metropolitan centers. Memphis to our north, New Orleans on the south, Mobile and Birmingham on the east were all built largely by Mississippi Packers. We need to attract more businesses and more industries to our state so we will have larger metropolitan centers. The right to work law will contribute much to increasing our metropolitan centers. If a majority of the qualified electors in Mississippi will vote to put the right to work law in the Constitution, it will bring more businesses to Mississippi, more industries, and when we have more businesses and more industries in Mississippi, we'll have a much wealthier state. We'll have a much broader tax base. I'm indeed grateful to the legislature that enacted a great economic development program during this past session. It enacted one of the greatest economic development programs ever enacted by any state. If the right to work law, friends, is made a part of the Constitution of Mississippi, it will tie in with the economic development program and mean much to future generations. Mississippi has received much favorable publicity when the legislature adopted our economic development program. Many of you will recall that it was favorable to mention in the United States News and World Report. If the right to work law is made a part of our Constitution, It'll mean much favorable publicity for the state of Mississippi. Your decision on the right to work referendum will appear on the ballot tomorrow. It's of extreme importance, ladies and gentlemen, to every man, woman, and child in Mississippi. When you go to the polls to vote tomorrow, vote for the right to work law. Make it a part of our state constitution. When you do that, you'll be voting for freedom of choice, which is a basic human right. And the people of Mississippi will have the right to choose whether or not they must join a labor union in order to work and make a living. May I urge you to go to the polls tomorrow and vote yes. Vote in the affirmative for the amendment. By doing so, you'll be voting in conformity with the ideals and the principles that our forefathers so graciously handed down to us. You'll be protecting unborn generations in our liberties and in our freedoms that we hold so dear. Thank you and good night. That's uh, same old Ladies thing. and gentlemen, Nothing. you have just heard the Honorable Ross R. Barnett, Governor of Mississippi, speaking from the studios of WJTV in Jackson. Well. On behalf of the right to work law, this was a paid political yeah. telecast. Black flag product designed specifically for every bug problem. Remember, the oh, only good bug is a dead bug. Black flag yeah. dead. That's right. Uh, what do you need to get behind Yeah, we tried to get behind him, but couldn't be done. Now he's going he's to run back over there and get on the other station. Now. Because right-to-work laws protect workers from forced unionism, new industries are moving to Mississippi at a growing rate. On June 7th, vote for the Right-to-Work Amendment, a paid political announcement by the Mississippi Right-to-Work Committee. At Bankers Trust Savings and Loan Association, all savings accounts are fully insured by the National General Insurance Company. Save by the 15th, earned from the 1st at Bankers Trust Savings and Loan Association, 
116 North Congress. Here, Judge J.G. Holmes speak on behalf of his candidacy for re-election to the Supreme Court tonight at 9:10 on channels 3 and 12. That's 9:10 tonight on channel 3 and channel 12. Can Mississippi stand any more right to work? No. Vote against right to work. This is a political announcement paid for by Mississippi Labor Council. Channel 12, Jackson. The Kate Smith Show brought to you by the Whitehall Company and seen normally at this time has been canceled tonight only. Tune in next Monday at this time for The Kate Smith Show. The following program is presented by the Mississippi Labor Council. Speakers are Mr. Jack Schaefer, Vice President of the Jackson Central Labor Union, and Mr. Ray Smithhart, Vice President of the Mississippi Labor Council, AFL-CIO. First, Mr. Schaefer. Good evening. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the officials of station WJTV for rearranging their programs in order that we might appear before you, the TV audience, to give some of the reasons for our objections to making the so-called right-to-work bill a constitutional amendment. <clears throat> it is true the only objections you have heard from are, are from organized labor, because we are the only ones that work for our employers on their contract covering wages, hours, and conditions of employment. If there is no contract, Certainly, there could be no union shop provisions, which is one of the aims of the so-called right-to-work law. Let us take just a moment and see what happens when a labor union is organized and see if there is any great change made because of the people that causes the people to change from a group of good cooperative employees to a bunch of second-class citizens. The very first reason for organizing is discontent among employees, usually low wages, poor vacations, if any, no sick leave, no seniority rights, frequent layoffs, and many other things that good productive employees are entitled to. They started looking around and asking questions as to how to organize. Sooner or later, they're in contact with someone that is familiar with the process. Normally, a representative from the branch of trade or craft in which they are engaged, comes in and holds a meeting with the people to let them know the procedures for conducting an election as prescribed by the taft Hartley law. <clears throat> Basically, this is it. If a majority of the employees working in this factory or industry want to be organized and so express themselves by signing authorization for representation cards, those cards are then filed with the National Labor Relations Board, which is a national agency. They, the board, come in and conduct a hearing to determine whether or not there is justification for an election, and if so, who is eligible to vote in the election. If there is justification for the election, then it is conducted by the National Labor Relations Board and under their supervision, along with the representative from both employer and union. Unless the majority of the eligible employees vote in favor of a union, there is no union for 12 months, unless either side can prove unfair labor practices have been committed. If so, the 12 month period does not hold true. True democracy is based on majority rule. So the same holds true here. I'm sure if our tax system was provided by such laws as our right to work law, quite a few of us that are now paying could claim our exemption. Remember, you only have a union through a process of democracy, and the right to work law abolishes a process of democracy. As I stated earlier, the right to work law prohibits a union shop clause in an agreement, even though it is desired by both the employer and majority of the employees. The Taft Hartley law specifically states that the union certified to bargain for a group of employees has to bargain for non-members the same as members so long as they are performing a job that 
that is covered under the contract. This means if an employee who is not a member feels they have been deprived of benefits provided in the contract, they have as much right to request the services of the union to process their grievances as any dues-paying member, and they do request and receive such services. I ask you, is this discrimination or not? I think any employer <coughs> will agree that good employee relations are an asset to any employer. Do you think such discriminatory legislation helps build good relations? If the union shop was desired by a majority of the employees and was agreed to by the employer, and I want to emphasize this too, the union shop provision is a negotiable item and it has to be agreed to by the employer. And anyone seeking employment with that employer would know that by a predetermined time he would have to join the union and pay his pro rata share of operating expenses of the union that bargains for his wages, hours, and working conditions. And here let me say <coughs> that if union dues were not cheaper under a union shop provision, then there would be some cause for alarm. Certainly the entire group could pay for the operation of their local union much cheaper than the mere majority or 51% could be the minimum. So certainly we think there is justification for union shop agreements. Any unfair thinking American that believes in democracy would agree that this is fair. If the one seeking employment just does not want to join the union or be associated with union members, certainly he would not want employment with this employer anyway and would seek employment where a union did not exist. At the time of his employment, he would be quoted the union shop provision just as his work hours or any other condition of employment would be. So he would be aware of the union shop provision before he was ever employed by the employer. Should at the expiration date of any legal contract between the employer and the union, a minority group of 30% or more was dissatisfied and felt they wanted no union, they have a right to petition the National Labor Relations Board for a decertification election. There again, you have the minority group having the right to determine whether or not they are covered by the bargaining unit. I raised the question in the beginning whether or not any changes transpired that would cause good cooperative employees to become second class citizens. Nothing but process of democracy has stipulated, as stipulated by law, has taken place and the wage earners have gotten in a position to bargain for a better standard of living for themselves and their families. I would like to emphasize here too, upon the certification of a union, the first order of business is for them to elect their officers through a democratic process as stipulated in the Taft-Hartley law. Certainly people who enjoy a decent standard of living can be of a better asset to this community than one having to live on substandard wages. They are, the same, they are the same people that you have been attending church with, making purchases from you, retail merchants, consuming the food and clothing that you, the members of the Farm Bureau, are producing just the same as ever, except in greater quantities because they are financially more able to enjoy a higher standard of living. I don't think anyone questions the contribution that organized labor has made to the economy of the nation. Certainly, if the purchasing power of the nation or state is not in the hands of the consumer to purchase the goods and services needed, our economy is in trouble. The right to work law, or the just an act of the legislature or an amendment to the Constitution, which would be in effect making it a permanent law unless Section 14B of Taft-Hartley is repealed, does not guarantee anyone employment, even if jobs exist at the time prospective employee makes application. 
In the course of the interview, the question is asked, if you have ever been a member of a labor union. Section 1, paragraph A of the so-called right to work law, entitled, Denial or Abridgement of Work, reads as follows. It is hereby declared to be the public policy of Mississippi that the right of a person or persons to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of membership or non-membership in any labor union or labor organization. It is common knowledge that if you are seeking employment with a non-union employer and answer the question truthfully, if you have been a union member, you will not be employed. <clears throat> if the law means what it says, then it should be of no concern to the potential employer whether the applicant has ever been a union member or not. We are constantly hearing of the economic gains made in the state since the enactment of the right to work law. There have been some gains, that is true, but have we received our proportionate share? And how can anyone be so positive that the right to work law is the conservative factor? Ray Smith is prepared to give some figures and comments on this. Thank you, Jack. Before I give figures on this, I would like to ask the people just who the proponents of this right to work are, should I say, the so-called right to work. The misnomer has been used in many cases to see the good people of Mississippi. To name these organizations that make up this right to work committee, along with our governor Barnett, we look like a who's who of Wall Street. Anyone concerned with the working conditions of this state should be really concerned over this legislation or constitutional amendments being voted on tomorrow. Just to give you some idea of who these people are, there, I said, was who who the Wall Street. These same organizations are always fault the working people, the little people, the poor people in Mississippi. You know as I know, 90% of all people in Mississippi are working people. They depend on their hands for a living. I ask you tonight just to name one thing that the big rich industrials have ever done for the working people in Mississippi. With headquarters in Wall Street, they're dictating to the people of Mississippi. Tomorrow, they will probably phone the results in and say they had you in economic slavery from now on. Oh yes, you might get a job he puts a plant down here in the state of Mississippi. But how is this plant built? It is built for your tax dollars. He pays no taxes on it for years. It is given to him. The only thing that you earn out of this plant is what little that you earn through your work. But is that enough for your tax dollars? I should say not. If you're only one of the employees that work in this plant, that you know that you work hard, slave, many hours. You only receive, in many cases, the bare minimum wage of a dollar an hour, and sometimes maybe a little bit more. It's a shame and disgusting thing for Mississippi workers to have to put up with what they are doing. In other states, they are receiving much more. But from the same company, operate here in Mississippi that you working for a dollar an hour they are paying two dollars doing the same thing maybe in the eastern and northern states that is not right when this same product sells in the market for the same thing regardless of where it's sold in Mississippi or California or Michigan or where have you it all seems to sell for the same thing but yet what they are doing they are taking the profits the huge profits they make off of us that we have been exploited and working Take the profits back to Wall Street. Workers in Mississippi have been suppressed for many years. They are just now beginning to where they can realize something out of it. But now what they are trying to do, they are trying to hamstring not only the unionized workers, but every worker in the state of Mississippi. Works in the retail shops, 
plants, factories, or anywhere you have, they will have you under their thumb from now on. You will never be able to uh, do anything about it because they'll have you hamstring with this right to work. Mississippi has been the bottom of the economic ladder for many years. And they tell you, in many cases, the right to work committee that the Mississippi is coming up on the ladder. But we have statistics to prove that it is not so. They are not coming up on the ladder. In fact, the business they get farther and farther behind. Only a few years ago, we were stopping $600 behind in the capital income in the state of Mississippi. Today, we are over 1000 this big business crowd knows this, and they are trying to, to sell you something that, in, that this will help you out, but it's not going to help you out. I would like to quote from Professor Pilot of Economics of Law of North Carolina, just a few things that he says that some of this right to work committee says it will do. It says, first, the argument most commonly advanced in support of right to work laws have no basic in fact. Right to work laws do not attract new industry that adds to the prosperity of a state, do not curtail the number of strikes. The overwhelming majority of employees affected want a union shop as do those employees with first hand experience. The underlying purpose of the right to work law is to hamstring union effectiveness. They know if they hamstring union effectiveness, it will mean that we will continue in economic slavery as we have for many a year. Approximately 100 years ago. Now, this is something here that this man has made an extensive study for approximately seven years of, of studying all facets of this thing. Now, I would like to say that the main uh, people that are behind this right to work is the Mississippi Economic Council, which is made up of the local chambers and the business groups of this state. Now, we've never known of those people trying to help us out anyway. They, they never tried to uh, promote. Uh, better wages for us. How many of you have ever had your employer come around and say, well, I think that you should get more money or you should get more paid holidays or you should have more vacations? They don't ever say that. <clears throat> Retail merchants is behind this. Now, why, why are they behind it for? I can't see why they would be because the more money in the community, the more they're going to sell. That's why I tell you why it is. The people, they work in their stores. These women work hard, long hours on their feet, work on the average of $25 to $30 a week. What they are afraid of, that they will have to pay a decent wages to these people if conditions would keep existing in the state of Mississippi where they would be organized and would come under a union contract which would provide them a decent standard of living. The Farm Bureau. Now, why is the Farm Bureau behind this? Now, you think a farmers would be behind it, but it's actually not the farmer, the dirt farmer, it is the big business, it's industrial farming, you might say, the farm implement dealer, the bankers, the all big businesses controls the farm bureau, they set the policies, it is not actually the real, what we know as a dirt farm. The NAM is the granddaddy of all of this. They have fought legislation that has affected the people for many years. I would just like to quote from some of the things that they said years ago. The spirit of labor union means socialism. We all know that recognition of union means but little else than absolute surrender that all guaranteed us by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Not only is this true from the standpoint of the employer, but it is also true with the relations to the wage earner, who upon a member of the labor union, Surrenders his individual liberties and coerces into slavery more damnable than the black man of the South. And those behalf of the Civil War was fought. The Revolution War was fought by our forefathers that we might enjoy the rights which a free man and citizen organized labor through its leaders with walking delegates say we shall not enjoy. Now I would like to say to them that when they said that, that was uh, Mr. John Kirby of the President of the uh, National Association of Manufacturers. He said that in a convention speech. There's no one that belongs to a labor union that says that the labor union has not done a wonders for them. And I don't think anybody will agree or uh, disagree with it. Here's another thing that was said by the President of the National Association of the Manufacturers. The national danger involves in long lost hours and more paid conspiracy. Now, this is the 1920. 
when labor unions was fighting to get out from under the 10 and 12 hour a day that they was under then. It said, furthermore, there can be no question but that the synthetic anti-industrial campaign waged by inside elements of promotional economic suicide, both within and without the ranks of radical socialism, for the constant reduction of working hours has made serious inroads in our native ability to create and maintain a profitable industrial nation. Now, this is the same people that's wanting to put the right to work in the Constitution. They want to go back to 10 and 12 hours a day, to economic slavery. In fact, then, as they said, we would, in other words, go back to the black man of the South of what they were trying to do to us down today. In 1929, it said, this is Mr. John E. Edison, President of the National Association of Manufacturers, 1929. But, but I would not be construed as advocating for anybody either a program of more than I am myself willing to undertake, or for one which would produce sufficient time for bodily rest, mentally refreshment, and spiritual cultivation. I can see that the so-called five-day week, which is being agitated as an industrial policy, has little of these worthy purposes, purposes of proposal. I hate they were the same group that is opposing of trying to put right to work in the Constitution that's saying that you couldn't have a, a five-day work week because it would disrupt the industrial life of our state of our nation. You can see it's all not true. This is something else that they said when we were trying to get accidental insurance for people who was hurt on the job. It's workman's compensation. This is a statement of Albert H. Harris, Vice President of the New York Central Line testimony and vice president of the uh, National Association of Manufacturers. In 1908, on employees liability act, the roads of economic hell. Pass this bill and gone with the wind is large self-government and salty of the state. Gone with the wind is our democratic system of government and all the institutions that we hold here. Now this is some of the things that they said back in the years past. It's history today. But the right to work in this Constitution of Mississippi is not uh, voted out tomorrow. It will be history for 25, 50, 100 years from day. My children, your children's children, and our children thereafter will be suppressed under this year so-called right to work. Now, Social Security is another thing. The National Association of Manufacturers, the same granddaddy of the right to work to put into the Constitution. They fought this in 1935. They call this year ultimate socialism control of life insurance. This is also the NAM on October 1935. Social Security, a counterfeit insurance policy. Now we have a lot of you old people out there are drawing insurance today. But you are a living, you are a substandard living today. But if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have anything. But they are saying back in 1936 that Social Security would be uh, something that would disrupt the whole economy of the United States. One man to another, sent a chapter to key employees of industry by the industrial division, saying, fight this thing, Social Security. And this is just a few of the things that they have uh, been against. I can go on and on and tell you uh, go, uh, what they have uh, proposed or tried to propose. I'll show you the same group that is proposed and putting the right to work in the Constitution and some of Mr. Barnett's friends. This paper right here, of course, you didn't see it in the daily papers. It was in a small print. But it said 700 Jackson area employees cheap workers out of $504,222. Now that's over a half a million dollars. It's the same group of people that's sponsoring the right to work to put into the Constitution. They are cheating them. Now, where was the right to work? We have it in this basic legislation. Now, where was the right to work there? What did it do? It didn't protect these people at all. They were cheated out of this same group that's trying to put this thing into the Constitution. Show you something else here that you didn't see in the daily papers either, but that's true. Now, these same employers right here, they cheated and didn't turn into Social Security and the income tax they deducted from the employees' pay amounted to something over $614,000. Now, are they trying to help us? No, they are trying to fatten their own, pay, their own checks just a little bit more. Because of something else here. 
says cheap wages, wages cause high workers' compensation insurance. You remember a few months ago that we was in the fight of trying to retain what provisions we had in our workers' compensation law, and it said the insurance premium was too high. What made that insurance premium was high because our workers received a dollar an hour, and it is based on the payroll dollar. In other states where they would have maybe one employee on a $100 payroll, we would have two to three employees. Of course, therefore, our, naturally, our insurance was high because we had two to three times as much liability. That's the same people that wants to put the right to work in Constitution. I think now I will go to show you some figures to refute some of the things that our people have said. We have a pamphlet here that's got uh, Governor Ross Barnett's uh, picture on it and Boswell Stevens. I'd like to say on this side here that he says here, the factory workers' wage increase is 33 cents per hour since 1954 through 58. Now, what he didn't tell you, he didn't tell you the truth about the thing. Now, the truth was they did increase 33 cents. But let's go back and show what this United States as an average did. Back in 1954, the capital income of the nation was $1,770. Mississippi was $876. In 1958, the per capita income had increased from $2,057 on the national average to $1,053. We lost here $177. In other words, we increased $177 national income to $287, which made us $110. Now, does that look like an increase? Go back here farther here. Louisiana, in the same period of time, they had $1,315. Today, they have $1,576. Increased $261. Now, that's still going to pan out to what they're telling you here. In Mississippi, in 1954, we was only $23.72 below the national average. Today, we are $31.34, which is $8. Right here, when they say on percentages here, we have plus 24.2 percent, the national average is 22.6 percent. We have lost, we've gained 33 cents here, the national average gained 49 cents. Louisiana, without a right to work law, with a basic wage of today of $2.14, cents, with a 55 cents an hour more than we are. I want to show you what the new industry has moved into Mississippi and what's compared to moving into Louisiana without a right to work. He said, they're telling you if we get the right to work in the Constitution, we will have all kinds of industry moving in. In 1959, Mississippi had $45 million. Louisiana had $130 million. 58, Mississippi had $38 million. Louisiana had $197 million. In 1957, Mississippi had $42 million. Louisiana had $238 million. 56, Mississippi had $80 million, Louisiana had $560 million. Total over that four-year period was Mississippi had $205 million, Louisiana had $1,125 million. Now, they have, do not have the right to work law in that. It is no, no case where they can prove that, in other words, the right to law work will bring in the industry in here because this here proves it's not so. Now, we have the same river that runs between us, the Mississippi River. We have the same Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. We same, have the same natural resources. We have, same, have the same people. Therefore, I say to you, we do not need no right to work to bring industry in this state. I would like to impress upon you people tomorrow to go to the polls and vote against this right to work, to put it into the Constitution, because if you once get it into the Constitution, you therefore die. from now on, you will never be able to repeat it. I ask you to go to the polls tomorrow and vote against this misnomer of the right to work. Thank you. You have just heard a program presented by the Mississippi Labor Council. <coughs> Speakers were Mr. Jack Schaefer and Mr. Ray <coughs> Sifart. Time paid by the Mississippi Labor Council. Assure Jackson and Hines County the many benefits of this 45,000 capacity stadium. Vote for the stadium bond issue tomorrow. You see on your TV screen the Superior Tire and Service Company in Canon, where $1 down puts any Gates tire on your car. 
Choice lawyer, manager, also remind you we have the equipment and the know-how for recapping tires, 616s to 1022. C, Superior Tire and Service Company in Canton. Phone 1810 for fast service. Hear Judge J.G. Holmes speak on behalf of his candidacy for re-election to the Supreme Court tonight at 9.10 on channels 3 and 12. That's 9.10 tonight on channel 3 and they on channel 12. They have it in the way, Jim, that did it. Governor Barnett urges that you vote for the right to work amendment. Hear him tonight at 7 o'clock on channel 12. A paid political announcement by the Mississippi Right to Work. The Texan, brought to you by the Brown Emergency and Tobacco Company, and usually seen at this time, has been canceled tonight only to permit us to present the following special program. Tune in next Monday night for The Texan on WGTV Channel 12. Time now, 7 o'clock. I got to shut out me putting the great Ladies and gentlemen, from the studios of WJTV in Jackson, we present the Honorable Ross R. Barnett, Governor of Mississippi, speaking in behalf of the Right to Work Law. This is a paid political telecast. And now, Governor Barnett. Fellow Mississippians, I want to talk with you for a little while about the Right to Work Law and the great advantages that all Mississippians would obtain if we could make it as a part of our state constitution. The legislature of the state of Mississippi voted overwhelmingly in favor of making the right to work law a part of our state constitution. In fact, the House of Representatives voted 109 to 16, and the Senate voted 33 to 6 in favor of making the right to work law a part of our state constitution. I want to call your attention to the fact that the resolution speaks for itself. Here's what a part of the resolution says. membership or non-membership And that is that it reserves the right of every worker to join a union if such person so desires. But it also provides that no one can be required or forced to join a union if such person does not want to. What could be more fairer than that? If he wants to join a union, he may do so. And if he does not want to join a union, no one can force him to join under the right to work law. It means he cannot be precluded from getting a job if he does not belong to a union and cannot be discharged from a job because he chooses to join a union. In other words, it gives the individual worker the right to choose whether or not he wants to join a labor union or a labor organization. Now there's some people who do not like this right to work law. Jimmy Hoffer is one of those men. Walter Ruther is another. And there are other selfish and greedy labor bosses in Chicago, in Detroit, New York, and other large cities who do not approve of this law. Most of them have selfish motives in that they want the power to control so they can force people to join a union by compulsion and by intimidation and to force them to pay the annual dues. 
liberty-loving Mississippians are not in favor of being intimidated or coerced into becoming a member of a union or any organization. I believe such person should be entitled to work in order that he may make a living for himself and his family without being coerced by some selfish labor boss to join a union before he can obtain a job. Freedom-loving people of Mississippi believe in freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is a great fundamental principle in our form of government, which is the greatest form of government that has ever been promulgated for man's benefit. We have been blessed here in Mississippi with the right to work law for more than six years. Nineteen states have the right to work law. What does it mean to the people of Mississippi to have the right to work law? Statistics show that the percentage of gains in earnings in Mississippi during the time since the enactment of our right to work law amounts to more than the average in the states where they do not have the right to work law. Increase in the wages of workers in manufacturing during right to work years. The average in the United States is 17%. That's the increase in wages of workers. But in Mississippi, since we've had the right to work law, you see it is 28%. No one can dispute those figures. Our gains and earnings have increased in Mississippi since the right to work law has been enforced. That clearly convinces me that the right to work law is very beneficial to all working people. If our right to work law is made a part of our Constitution, it will contribute much in the years that lie ahead toward bringing more businesses and more industries to Mississippi. It will contribute much toward creating new jobs, more job opportunities, higher income per person, more take-home money, and a higher standard of living. It will mean industrial freedom for our people. We all believe in industrial freedom. It will contribute much to creating better industrial climate for all of our people. Mississippi and all other American states that have a right to work law have prospered materially since the enactment of the right to work law. The 19 states that have the right to work law show an average increase in their economies more than 24 percent. Here's a chart that has been prepared showing the number of new industrial jobs during the right to work years in the United States 4.4 percent. In Mississippi 8.5. 29,000 new jobs created in Mississippi during the right to work years. Therefore, friends, there's a difference in the earnings of the states that have the right to work law and the ones that do not have such law. For instance, I want to call your attention to the economic conditions in the state of Indiana. In Nation's Business Magazine of February 1960, there are certain reasons given why the state of Indiana leads the nation in plant construction, that is, in new construction, per capita for six straight years. Indiana leads the nation in new plant construction per capita for the six straight years. And friends, there are five reasons listed in this nation's business magazine of February 1960. Their first reason is the right to work law. The right to work law that Indiana has had for many years and many still years. has, which is a major industrial state. For many years. Not stupid. Three years. He said it has contributed much to right. the economic condition of Indiana no, and other years. states where such laws have been enforced. 
On the front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal this morning, that you may have noticed the headline there it says Strike Menaces Missile Bases in California. California has no right to work law. They can tie up labor in defense installations and materially affect our national security. We need larger metropolitan centers in Mississippi. One reason our income has been so low in Mississippi is because we do not have large metropolitan centers here. Memphis to the north of us, and by the way, I call it the capital of North Mississippi recently when I spoke to a Rotary Club up there. New Orleans to the south, Mobile and Birmingham to the east, are cities which have been largely built by Mississippi patronage. We need to attract more businesses and more industries to our state so that we will have larger metropolitan centers in the state of Mississippi. The right to work law will contribute much toward obtaining larger metropolitan centers. If a majority of the qualified electors in Mississippi will vote to put the right to work law in the Constitution. It'll help bring more businesses and more industries here. When we bring more businesses and more industries to Mississippi, we'll have a much wealthier state. We'll have a much broader tax base. In fact, your taxes should be lowered when we have get more industries here, more wealth, because we'll have more people who are able to pay taxes. I'm indeed grateful for a legislature that enacted an economic development program which will mean much to the, the development of our state in the years that lie ahead. Our legislature recently <coughs> enacted one of the greatest economic development programs that has ever been enacted in any state in the American Union. If the right to work law is made a part of our Constitution, it will tie in with our economic development program, and it will mean much to future generations. Well, you ought to be able to make that Mr. Sickner received much favorable speech, publicity when the legislature adopted our economic development program. Many of you will recall that we had a nice write-up in the United States News and World Report. It was favorable mentioned in the United States News and World Report. It said that one state reduces taxes. Now after tomorrow, we want some publicity that Mississippi has put the right to work law in its constitution. If the right to work law is made a part of our constitution, friends, it'll mean much favorable publicity for our state, and tomorrow the voters of Mississippi will have an opportunity give me a good to place our uh, state on record in the eyes of the nation two million as a state which now. believes in the freedom of all individuals. The right to work law is a basic human right and should be forever preserved. It should be perpetuated for all of the citizens of our state and future generations. I have great faith in the voters of Mississippi. I believe that when the people understand both sides of this question, they will unquestionably make an intelligent and a logical choice. And I believe that that choice is bound to be in favor of the amendment. And I'll stand by your decision. Your decision on the right to work referendum will appear on the ballot tomorrow. And it is of extreme importance to every man, woman, and child in Mississippi. If you go to the polls tomorrow and vote for the right to work law, vote for it becoming a part of our Constitution. That is, if you vote for the amendment, you'll be voting for freedom of choice which is a basic human right. And the people of Mississippi will have the right to choose whether or not 
they must join a labor union or labor organization in order to obtain employment. This being a basic human right, the right to work law should be made a part of our state constitution, and it is my hope that the voters of Mississippi will vote for the amendment to our constitution. Friends, may I urge that you go to the polls tomorrow and cast that sacred ballot, and may I ask that you vote yes. That is, vote in the affirmative for the amendment to the state constitution. By so doing, you'll be voting in conformity, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, with the ideals and the great fundamental principles that our forefathers so graciously handed to us. And you'll be voting for freedom of choice. You'll be voting for basic human rights. <coughs> You'll be protecting generations, ladies and gentlemen, yet unborn. You'll be protecting them in our liberties and in our freedoms that our fathers and our forefathers fought, bled, and died for. The freedoms that we hold so dear. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the amendment to the state constitution. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask you to watch and listen to Mr. Cecil Mill, Cecil the Mill, in a film presentation made available by the National Right to Work. Cecil B. DeMille, speaking to you from Hollywood. And I'm speaking to you now, not as a motion picture producer and director, but as a private citizen who believes that every American must have the right to earn a living for himself and his family, whether he belongs to a labor union or not. Today, in more than half the states, Unions have the legalized power to force a man to join them and support causes to which he may be conscientiously opposed. Can you, as a responsible citizen, close your eyes to the fact that in your own state, a man's right to work can be taken away from him by the whim of a labor board? Can you afford to leave such power in any hand. Like most Americans, I work for a living, and I'm a member in good standing of one labor organization. I am also a member in bad standing of another labor organization. In 1944, because I refused to pay a $1 assessment to support a political stand to which I was opposed, I was suspended by that other union. As a result of that suspension, I lost my right to work in radio and television. The loss of my radio job did not bankrupt me, but it woke me up with a terrible jolt to my responsibility and to your responsibility to work for legislation that will protect men and women to whom the loss of a job might mean disaster. In the near future, you are going to be faced with a showdown. This simple piece of paper will decide your fate. It may decree that someday you will be ordered to join a labor union or give up your right to work, your means of support. It is the admitted purpose of the big labor bosses to organize every wage earner and every salaried worker in this nation 
That means you. No matter how you feel about it. And it can be done. As long as we have compulsory unionism. And so the question of freedom for the individual, which in other times and other states has been kicked around as a political issue, is at last yours to decide. This is your once-in-a-lifetime chance to declare that labor unions were made for man, not man for the union. It is essential that you know the truth about this issue and the facts behind it. First of all, it is true that compulsory unionism denies the rights of the individual. Of those employed in a union shop, many believe wholeheartedly in benefits they receive from the union. That is as it should be, for no one would, or for that matter could, deny these people the right to join the union if they want to. But what of the men who do not consider the union beneficial? Here is the first instance of the rights of an individual being denied. For although such a wage earner does not agree with the policies of the particular union to which he is forced to pay dues, he does not have a choice. He must join or lose his job. Now let's look into the case of the union members themselves. They too can have their rights taken away from them. Suppose they object to some phase of union activity. If they do, there is very little they can do about it. Under the present circumstances, a union member must continue to pay his dues or lose his job. And so he has no really effective way of objecting to anything. The edicts simply come down from the union boss's office and the rank and file member is under pressure to support them. Hence, congressional hearings have revealed many of the evils which have grown up out of compulsory unionism evils which blacken the good name of labor. The frauds and misuse of union funds, which are crimes against the union members themselves, forced to pay for activities they may be opposed to. And the violence, planned and carried out by paid henchmen. Such evils are in part the result of giving to the union boss the power to take away a man's right to work, of blessing compulsory unionism with legal sanction. Any state which is expanding industrially is a prime target for those who wield the power of compulsory unionism, including corrupt union bosses and their racketeering associates. Not only does the wage earner suffer under compulsory unionism, but the general public as well. Farmers may find themselves forced to pay lugs to the unions in order to transact business. Remember... These are not scenes written by a Hollywood scriptwriter. These are true stories, just a few of many on record across the state. And here is something else to remember. Compulsory unionism can be outlawed without endangering the legitimate purpose of any labor organization. What happens to unions, you may ask, what happens to unions and to the general wage structure when employees are no longer forced to join a labor union to hold their jobs? Let's look at the facts. 18 states already have guaranteed freedom for the wage earner. Workers are free to choose for themselves whether or not they want to join a union. And in those states, according to the latest public figures, Union membership voluntarily increased 192%, as compared to only 188% increase in other states. Unions have grown faster in states with voluntary unionism. Also, in those states where union membership is now entirely voluntary, the hourly wage rates increased 21% from 1952 to 1956, as opposed to a smaller increase of 19% in the other states. Department of Labor figures are conclusive. Wages increased at a faster rate in states with right-to-work laws. Again, you mind my wage is in the In the tumult and shouting that lies ahead, you will hear the voice of the union boss crying, unions must have security. What that statement really means is that the union boss must have security. 
he must be secure in his knowledge that no matter how he manipulates the Union or its funds, his power will remain supreme. When wage earners have the right to work, whether or not they belong to a union, the union boss is returned to his proper place, serving his membership, providing the kind of good leadership which ensures security for a voluntary organization. Put this down on your list of truths when you consider the right to work amendment. This amendment will give back to the wage earner freedom from unscrupulous labor bosses. The wage earner who benefits from dedicated leadership will support his union. Freedom of choice imposes responsibility for ethical action on the part of the working man as well as on his leaders. If he benefits, he should join, but he must be the one who decides. Both the employer and the labor union may try to make you forget that the fight for guaranteed freedom of employment is a battle to protect the individual, that is you, to protect you from both of the favored interests. For under our present laws, both the employer and the union, bargaining in their own interests, can enter into a contract which violates your right to freedom of choice, a contract which can deny you the right to make up your own mind, about whether or not you want to join a union. And this is the ultimate truth about the right to work. It is not against labor. It is not for management. It is for the worker, caught between these two forces, who has no protection. It is for you. Under the right to work, you, whether you see fit to join a union or not to join a union, you are guaranteed your freedom of choice. Those of us who are in this fight welcome the support of business if business believes in the freedom of the individual. We welcome the support of labor unions if unions put the rights of their members as individuals before any other consideration. What kind of people are in this fight? A farmer? A businessman? a doctor, a newspaper editor, a motel owner, a teacher, an aircraft worker, a lawyer, and a rancher's wife. Anyone who realizes that now is the time for us to declare our freedom. This is your great chance, this ballot. This is the showdown. It is your last chance, too, for the final showdown will be, as it always is, with you who must choose between freedom and oppression, a matter for your own conscience. Is it wrong to compel any man to belong to any private organization? This film has been brought to you by the National Right to Work Committee, a coalition of employees and employers dedicated to the principle of voluntary unionism. If you believe that Americans should have the right but not be compelled to join labor unions, offer your assistance to the National Right to Work Committee, 1025 Connecticut Avenue, Washington 6, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, the preceding film presentation and the address by Governor Barnett were presented as a paid political telecast by the Mississippi Right to Work Committee. I got the damn seal on there again. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Can Mississippi stand any more right to work? No. Vote against right to work. This is a political announcement paid for by the Mississippi Labor Council. <laughs> I don't get it. Keep it on. prove that wages have risen in right-to-work states. Vote for the right-to-work amendment. 
a paid political announcement by the Mississippi Right to Work Committee. Hear Judge J.G. Holmes speak on behalf of his candidacy for re-election to the Supreme Court. Right to work simply and clearly stated is freedom of choice. Freedom to join a union or to refuse to join a union. In other words, it is voluntary unionism. One of the most effective tactics of those opposing freedom of choice or voluntary unionism is the confusion with which they deliberately attempt to distort the right to work principle. They do this simply because they know, as we know, that the vast majority of the people in this nation support the principle of freedom of choice and will support the principle of right to work when they understand it. Fearful that their own power will suffer under a system of freedom of choice or voluntary unionism, the union bosses in the North and East who seek to control the laboring people of this state and to extract money from them to be used in promoting integration of the races in the South and their apologists seek to protect their selfish interests by confusing the public regarding the meaning and purposes of work, right to work. It doesn't make any difference what you call it, whether right to work, freedom of choice, voluntary unionism, or whatever other term you give. What we mean is simply the right of every employee to choose for himself whether or not he wishes to belong to a labor union. That is what right to work legislation guarantees, and that is what is meant, the right of each employee to choose for himself whether or not he wishes to belong to a labor union. Tomorrow, Mississippians will vote on the right to work amendment to the state constitution. This amendment protects our citizens now and for the future from being forced to join a union. It guarantees that union membership will be voluntary, not compulsory. Under voluntary membership, union officials must be responsive to the wishes of union members. Therefore, control rests with the members, not with labor bosses in distant parts of the nation. However, compulsory members are captive members, and in states which do not have the right to work law, workers cannot effectively protest against union orders handed down from the top. Do you know the purpose of the right to work amendment? Listen to these words of the amendment itself, as approved by more than two-thirds of Mississippi's state senators and representatives. I quote, it is hereby declared to be the public policy of Mississippi that the right of persons to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of membership or non-membership in any labor union or labor organization, end of quote. As you can see, this amendment protects the right to join a union as well as the right not to join. It guarantees freedom of choice to the wage earner. A near even or small majority vote tomorrow could be interpreted as an unfavorable attitude in Mississippi toward industry, and it would greatly hurt the industrial development of Rankin County and Mississippi. Citizens of Rankin County, I urge all of you to go to the polls tomorrow and vote for the amendment and thereby lend a helping hand to the industrial development of the county and the state. I thank you. You have just heard Mr. J.C. Murray, President of the Rankin County Chamber of Commerce. Time for this political broadcast paid for by the Rankin County Chamber of Commerce. Government figures prove that wages have risen faster in right-to-work states vote for the Right to Work Amendment, a paid political announcement by the Mississippi Right to Work Committee. Those of you that haven't yet given up the ghost and went to bed and left us, I shall assure you that 
I personally regret the fact that it's necessary for us to interrupt your TV programs tonight. But inasmuch as the people that instigated this project have seen fit to bring it to the people of Mississippi in this fashion, then we have no other choice than to follow likewise. <coughs> At the outset, I'd like to say that I am not one of these outsiders that you have been referred to, that I am a native of the state. As a matter of fact, my parents were, or my ancestors rather, were among the first settlers of the state of Mississippi <coughs> and the southern end of Jackson County. I'm sure that all of you, or that at least most of you, should recognize the fact that the trade union movement of this country has always been one of the staunchest defenders of our dem democratic way of life, of our democratic institutions, and that had it not been for the work and the labors of people long before us, that possibly our institution would not, institutions would not be where they are today. Unfortunately, the people of Mississippi have today experienced one of their worst days. You have seen the governor of this great state of ours take the side of management and of the special interest groups and a controversy that in our opinion he should have remained clear of. I'm satisfied that some of our friends saw James K. Vorderman roll over in his grave when the governor took the podium this afternoon. James K. Vorderman warned our people of the dangers that, are now, that we are now confronted with. You have witnessed in the past few weeks, the past couple of days, especially, a press that has been subjugated by the vested, in, vested interest. We have seen the press handle the news in connection with this misnamed right to work proposition in all kinds of fashions. Very seldom have we received the treatment that we felt should have been given to the cause of which we represent. There were a few, however, that did try to report the news or the story as they saw it. For those people, we give our sincere thanks. My friends, tonight I would like to discuss with you just briefly the method that our opponents or the proponents of this deplorable piece of legislation, the method that those people use to arrive at where we are today. I'm convinced that you people, the ones that are yet with us, are about as confused as you can possibly be in connection with the proposition, and I shall not try to expound on the issues at hand to a great extent, except to say this simply. The proposition that you shall vote on will simply do this. It will take away from our trade unions and away from the employer groups, the right to negotiate a security clause into a working agreement. It does nothing else. It does not give anyone the right to a job. It does not, by any stretch of imagination, grant anyone any more freedom than they had prior to the passage of this act in 1954. You have had this misnamed right to work proposition on the statute book since that time, and it's very strange to us, and this is what we can't understand. With this act already on the statute books, the proponents of this proposition have now seen fit, fit to make it part of our basic law, the Constitution. Now, let me ask you to give this matter a little careful consideration because this should disturb you above all else because I'm convinced that the majority of our people in this great state of ours believe very much in the democratic processes as such. And they should expect, and I believe they do expect, 
that the legislature of this state should, above all else, abide by the Constitution themselves when it comes to amending that Constitution. And I say to you very frankly here tonight that if the legislature and the governor of this state can flaunt that Constitution in the face of, the, of our people and take away the basic rights that we felt that we had, by simply stampeding our people into this kind of a proposition and violating the laws themselves that those people have sworn to uphold, then we are indeed in bad trouble. If this can happen to our trade union movement, then it simply means that it can happen to other groups likewise. And I say to the people that are members of the various cooperatives around the state, REA, the farm co-ops and people of that kind, that you should take particular notice of what is about to happen in this state because it's quite possible that you shall be next. The governor of this state has been used, and make no mistake about this, as a tool of a special interest crowd in this state. They were not satisfied in receiving some 15 to 18 million dollars in the form of tax concessions they had to go all the way. They were not satisfied with completely emasculating the workmen's compensation laws of this state. They were not satisfied with denying our school teachers the just income that they have so long deserved in the form of increased salaries. They were not satisfied in denying our old people some additional compensation they were not satisfied with these things. They had to, at the, at, at the last, put the chain around labor's neck to make the thing complete. Now, I have asked the governor recently, in the form of a letter, to answer a few questions. Up until this time, he has not seen fit to answer these questions, at least not to myself, and as far as I know, he has not answered it for the press. At this time, I would like to ask the governor this question. Is there any foundation to the rumor that you received some $40,000 towards your campaign deficit for your support of this outrage? I would also like to ask the governor this question. What is your explanation of the fact that the Workmen's Compensation Commission is moving into the Barnett Building in Jackson, Mississippi, in quarters of greater cost and with less space in fun. I think that the people of this state are deserving of answers to those questions. The governor this afternoon tried to imply that this misnamed right to work proposition would not take away any of labor's rights that it was a proposition that organized labor should support. How foolish can we get? The proponents of this piece of legislation, if you please, let's examine who they are. These people are the same people that have always opposed any social legislation that would benefit the big masses of our people. This includes the public schools, the eight-hour day, workmen's compensation, unemployment insurance, and things of that kind. You simply have to go behind the scenes and see who these people are to realize exactly what is about to happen here. Now, we have had our good governor here today to come before the people and tell the people of this state that this legislature that just recently adjourned has enacted one of the greatest programs that this state has ever seen. Let me say something to you in connection with this, friends. And I believe that four years from now, that the facts will be, that the facts will bear me out that unless something drastically happens within the next few years, that this administration will go down in history as one of the worst that this state has ever seen. What has this legislature done? 
What has this administration done? This administration, for the first time in a long time, has put this state behind the eight ball financially. We were in good shape when the governor went into power. Today we find that even after stretching the contemplated budget till it was about to break, that we are now $2 million in the red. Now I would like to ask the governor this question. What do you intend to do when the next session of the legislature comes into power? Do you intend to increase a sales tax? Or what is your program? Where do you intend to get the money to operate this state? Do you propose to take it away from the widows and orphans? That's my question, brother. My friends, a lot of men said here today concerning industrialization. I say to you that the proposition that you'll vote on tomorrow will not attract the type of industry that we need in this state. It will not bring substantial industry to this state. It will, however, attract the only the, in, the industry that we can do well without. The industry that we will receive is, in, in respect to this legislation, will only attract the runaway shop, the shop that wants to pay nothing but the lowest wage. That's what this proposition is designed for, and don't be misled. Let me assure you of one thing, that if you vote against this proposition, you will do one thing. You will leave this proposition on the statute books as it presently is. You will simply keep it from going into the Constitution, thereby giving an enlightened legislature a chance to repeal this matter in the future when the people of this state realize the fact that this proposition is not what it's cut out to be. It is simply a misnomer nominer, that all it's designed to do is to lower the wages and the living standards of our people. I say to you in all sincerity that the people of this state are entitled to every consideration of any other people in any other state. And to expect any less, I can't feel that it's too much. My friends, let me say this to you again, that you have got to examine behind the scenes. You've got to look at who is supporting this proposition to really understand what it's all about. Again, let me remind you that the people that are in support of this proposition have not only used the governor as their tool, they have used the great seal of this state. And I say to you, it's a disgraceful situation. And let me ask you, in all sincerity, to go to the polls tomorrow and defeat this proposition. Thank you very much. You've just heard Mr. Claude Ramsey, the president of the Mississippi Labor Council, AFL-CIO. Time for the preceding telecast paid for by Mississippi Labor Council, AFL-CIO. <coughs>